good Sunday morning to you. So good to be with you through this format, this Lord's Day morning, and to have this time to spend together to study God's Word. I hope you've got your Bible with you. want to encourage you to open to the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Uh, we'll start there with that last verse of that last epistle that was written by the Apostle Peter. I want to talk about signs of spiritual maturity in our study this morning. I don't know about where you live, but here in Southwest Ohio, we've got a cloudy morning and uh, the promise of some rain today. We'll see what happens. I'm confident we could use the rain, but sunshine is always good. Uh, I, I plan to be back on Wednesday at seven o'clock Eastern time. We wrapped up our study of the sayings of the cross this past week. I'm not quite sure yet what I want to get into uh, for our next study. So I don't know what to tell you about this Wednesday night, other than we will, I do plan to be here uh, at seven o'clock Eastern and we'll be studying God's word together at that time. It's been a challenging week this past week for us here at Knollwood. Uh, we had a member of the congregation pass away and we had her funeral this past week. Uh, sickness, uh, continues to to spread and be uh, and to have an impact upon members here. Uh, even uh, the reality of COVID hitting uh, us here at Knollwood. Uh, and so uh, there's there's that, and and some are uh, quarantining, continue to quarantine just out of precaution uh, regarding themselves, and they don't want to pass it on to anyone else. And so it's really hit home here at Knollwood this past week or so. Uh, and we have a lot who are out of town. I'm looking forward to being with the members here in, in about an hour and then again at three o'clock, but I know that we have several who are out of town and, and we're praying for their safe return and they're missed when they are not here. So we continue to have many things to pray for, not just in our own lives and not just in our, our close immediate circle of friends and family, uh, but in our nation as well. Uh, I hear sirens going on just outside the the window uh, right now as I'm saying this. And every time I, I hear that, I think, well, someone someone's in trouble. So there's there's the constant reminder uh, that we need God's help through our lives, and we need God's help in this world. And so there's always the need for us to be praying. Let's pray together, and then uh, let's turn our attentions to God's word. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the peaceful night's rest and the new day that you've given us. We're thankful for all the blessings that come with it. This being the first day of the week, there's the promise of a new day and a new week that lies ahead. And we pray that you would give us the courage we need to face whatever challenges may come, that we would serve you faithfully and we would be a blessing to those who are in our lives. We pray for our nation that you would bless us with safety and you would bless us with peace. For those who are sick and hurting, we pray your relief. For those who are troubled, who are discouraged, who are mourning and grieving, we pray your comfort. Bless us as we study your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 18, the very last contribution that the Apostle Peter makes to the New Testament is this admonition. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Regardless of how old a person is when they become a Christian, we know that new Christians are babes in Christ. And they they are are in that infancy spiritually and they need care and they need nourishment they need protection in a way they need everything that a a physical newborn would need but just as we expect babes to grow we expect new christians to grow as well what i want to talk about are the the signs or the identifying marks of a mature Christian. 
Last Sunday morning, we studied in Luke chapter 5, and we talked about the cost of discipleship. When Jesus was calling Peter, Andrew, James, and John, uh, we noted that there were some things that discipleship demanded demands of us and when we get started we need to we need to realize those demands what i want to do with our study today is i want to look ahead i want to hit fast forward and i want to take a look at a mature christian and the bible tells us that there are some things that are are some identifying marks of a person who is spiritually mature and what we need to do we need to look at the scriptures we need to understand what these are and we need to see how well we are measuring up are we doing what peter tells us to do are we growing or have we have we reached our plateau and and, and we're no longer growing and no longer pleasing god uh, in our spiritual development that's the challenge i want to set before you and myself as we study this morning five things i want us to consider Five identifying marks of a of a mature Christian or, or signs of spiritual maturity. First is the ability to take solid food. That is, a mature Christian should understand the scriptures. Let's go back a few pages in the New Testament. Go back, go back to the book of Hebrews. So so turn back uh, to the book of Hebrews at chapter five. What I want to do. I want to start in chapter 5 and verse 12 and read on into chapter 6 and verse 3. The chapter and verse divisions were added by men. And uh, most of the time, these do a very good job of dividing up the different books into the, the proper sections. But there are times when I feel that the division is a little unfortunate. And that's the way it is here at the end of the book of Hebrew or at the end of Hebrews chapter five. Uh, I believe the thought continues on into chapter six. And that's the way I'm going to read it. Uh, let's let's be in Hebrews chapter five. And we're going to start at verse 12 and go through chapter six and verse three. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. There is a difference between a babe in Christ and someone who is of full age or someone who is a mature Christian. The difference is that the babe is unskilled in the word of righteousness. Chapter 5, verse 13 says, the ability to take solid food, that is the meat of the word, to turn to to understand some of the meatier passages of scripture comes from experience. There's no shortcut to experience. You and I can understand the word of God, but it's going to take time. It's going to take time and it's going to take effort in studying the scriptures. We don't get it overnight. God doesn't just pour the information into one of our ears while we're sleeping at night. Uh, we are not instructed to go away to a seminary where we can be trained by a theologian to understand the meteor passages of Scripture. No, it, it comes by reading, and it comes by studying. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, I, I always like the King James rendering of this verse, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or handling accurately the word of God. The only way that you and I can know how to, how to accurately handle the Bible is by spending time in it and studying it 
and learning it. Isn't it, isn't it amazing to watch a person who has given years and years of their life to doing something, to, to watch them do those things? Maybe it's, it's a mechanic. And, and you bring your car in and you, you explain to them the noise that the car is making, they know, they know already what the problem is. They know how it's gonna be fixed. Uh, and that's amazing to me, but they've spent their life doing that. I like to watch the, the show, Dr. Pole. I've been watching that for a number of years. My wife and I have. Uh, and we enjoyed it. It's on Nat Geo Wild, I think it is. And and here's a man who's in his 70s, and he's been practicing veterinary me medicine his whole life. And on that show, someone will bring in an animal, uh, and and he'll look and he'll know. Most of the time, he'll know right away what's wrong and how to treat it. Why? Because he spent his whole life doing that. Have we been spending time? reading and studying the scriptures. A spiritually mature person has. That is, a, that is a mark of spiritual maturity if we know more than just the milk of the word. If we can get into the meatier, more complex, difficult passages of scripture and we can get a grasp on those, we can understand how, what it means, how it applies to our lives, we can explain it to others, that's a mark of spiritual maturity. So a mature Christian, number one, is someone that knows the Bible, that knows the scriptures. Secondly, we'll stay right here in this passage, and we see another mark of maturity, and that is a spiritually mature Christian knows the difference between right and wrong. Look with me again at chapter 5 and verse 14. Hebrews 5 verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. One of the benefits of spending time in the Word of God, putting effort into the Word of God, because the text says exercised. One of the benefits of exercising ourselves spiritually by spending time in God's word is that we become equipped to be able to tell the difference between right and wrong, between good and evil. The word discern in our text means to make a judgment, to distinguish between choices. There are a lot of people that don't like judgments. Don't judge me. You, you can't judge this or you can't judge that. But the Bible calls upon us to make judgments all the time. And the most basic judgment to make is between what's right and what's wrong. And a mature Christian should have that, should have a handle on that, should have that taken care of. When a Christian makes unwise judgments concerning moral issues and the application of biblical principles to things like the way that they dress. Uh, the kind of entertainment that they enjoy, their involvement in drugs and, and alcohol, uh, whether they abstain from the lust of the flesh or they fulfill those lusts, all of these things determine, show us where their maturity is. And if they're not making those judgments between what is right and what is wrong, and they're doing those things that are wrong, that shows us where they are on that scale of spiritual maturity. Sometimes I'll encounter a Christian who is making the wrong choice about some of these matters, and they'll say, you know, I just don't see anything wrong with that. And you know what? They don't. I believe them. They don't see anything wrong with that because they haven't spent time in God's word learning what's wrong with that. And if they had, they'd know what was wrong. They could see what was wrong with that. They'd know what was wrong with that. Spiritual maturity is, is shown in us knowing the difference between right and wrong. We don't always make the right choice with that. But a person who is spiritually mature knows the difference between what is right and what is wrong. 
let's turn to the book of James. You'll just need to turn a few pages in your Bible to James chapter two, uh, James chapter three, rather. James chapter three. We've noted that a person who is spiritually mature is someone who knows their Bible. And as a result of that, they know the difference between right and wrong. Now, James chapter three shows us that a spiritually mature person knows how to control themselves. Specifically, they know how to control their tongue. They know how to control their mouth. In James chapter three, verse two, it says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. He's perfect. He's mature. He's made it. How can we tell that? If he's able to control his tongue, if he's able to keep from sinning with his words. James is going to go on and compare the tongue to, to a fire. Uh, let's, let's continue reading. Look at verses three through six. James says, indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boast great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. The tongue is a fire. And here's the thing about a fire. A fire can be used for good, and a fire has potential to do great harm. The same thing is true with our tongue. A fire can be used to cook a meal. It can be used to heat a home. Uh, it can be used to give light in the darkness, but left unattended, that fire can erupt and can burn and can destroy. A, a great forest is, is kindled by a little fire. See, they had forest fires all the way back then. That's not anything new. And a great fire, and we have these great fires that happen uh, in different parts of the country, but it seems like uh, in recent years that they've been on the West Coast. It, it starts with what? Some sparks from a power line, uh, a, a cigarette that was thrown out of a car window that was still lit, um, a campfire that wasn't put out. Very small sparks, very small flames cause all this devastation. The same thing is true with our tongue. Our tongue has potential for good. We can encourage people. We can lift them up. We can warn people and keep them out of danger. We can tell people what they have to do to be saved. But our tongues also have great potential for harm and for destruction, gossip, slander, abusive language, lying, teaching things that are false and do a lot of harm and a lot of damage. A mature person realizes, understands how much power their words have, and they act accordingly. They show restraint. They think before they speak, and they say only those things that are going to be helpful and never things that are going to be harmful. In fact, our conduct shows our maturity uh, more than our words. Look down in, in verse 13 of James chapter 3. Let me, let me uh, explain to you why, why I say that. James spends verses 1 through 12 talking about the tongue and how dangerous the tongue is. But this section starts in verse 1 with James saying, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing we shall receive a stricter judgment. Why would a person want to become a teacher? Well, one of the the, the drives to become a teacher, uh, one of the reasons someone might want to get up in front of others and teach is so that they can show off how much they know. They can show just how wise they are. James, after talking about the danger of the tongue, he says in verse 13, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct 
that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Our wisdom, our maturity, is not shown by all the things that we can say. It's really shown in our conduct. And that conduct begins with self-control, controlling our words. As a matter of fact, it's not the multiplication of our words or, or, or telling everything that we can tell that will reveal our wisdom, but it's actually the ability to control our words. A favorite passage of mine is in Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. As a matter of fact, I, I made a meme with these verses a, a number of weeks ago and put it out on Facebook. And I know that just made my children cringe uh, for me to say that. Uh, but this is a favorite passage of mine. Proverbs chapter 17, verses 27 and 28. He who has knowledge spares his words, and a man of understanding is of a calm spirit. Even a fool is counted wise when he holds his peace. When he shuts his lips, he's considered perceptive. I love that passage. I forget who's credited with the quote, but the saying is, I'd rather have someone think I'm a fool than to open up my mouth and remove all doubt. A mature person controls their words. One of the signs of spiritual maturity is self-control. And there isn't anything that's more difficult to control than our mouths. And so a mature Christian controls their mouth. Fourth, a mature Christian knows how to love. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. And in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord is taking the standard that was established by the religious teachers of his day, and he's showing how the standard of his kingdom is actually much higher than what they have been taught and they have been encouraged to do. The last one of these comparisons is the subject of love. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, let's read these together and let me warn you, prepare yourself to be challenged. Matthew chapter 5, 43 through 48, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. But, well, how can we ever be perfect? Think about our subject today, mature, maturity. I want to aim for maturity. I want to be mature. I'm going to have to learn how to love the way God loves. It's easy to love like the world loves. They love their own. They love those who love them. And that's an easy thing to do. But is there any greater challenge than trying to love someone who hates us and causes us harm? It takes a mature Christian to be able to love someone who at the best is being indifferent towards us. And at the worst is causing us harm and intending to do us harm. The law of Moses never taught the children of Israel to hate their enemies. That was a flat-out perversion of God's law. However, the high standard that Christ sets for his disciples is that we are to love everyone, even our enemies. And I remind you that Bible love, agape love, is not that ooey, gushy, emotional, feel-good love. 
It's active good will. We will do what is in the best interest of others if we love them, even our enemies. And so we will bless those who curse us. We'll do good to those who hate us. We will pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. Uh, Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 that in doing good, we're heaping coals of fire upon their head. And that will melt that heart of stone. And if anything will turn them, it will be the love of God shown in God's people, loving even their enemies. We are to love one another. And when we do, loving all people, even our enemies, when we do, verse 45 says that we are acting like our Father in heaven. It's not hard if you if you know my dad, it's not hard for you to know that I, I'm his son. We've got a lot of things in common. And to me, there's no greater compliment than when someone says, you sound like your dad on the phone, or you look you look like your dad. There's no greater compliment that can be made than when people look to the children of God and see that we're acting like God instead of acting like the world. A mature Christian doesn't love like the world loves. A mature Christian has learned how to love like God. And that's not an easy thing to do. And finally, I want us to consider the fact that a mature Christian realizes they're not there yet. A mature Christian realizes that they have to keep maturing. Turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Love the book of Philippians. Uh, I love the, the truths that are taught in every chapter of this short book. We studied it together uh, a number of months ago. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15. Philippian, Philippians 3, verses 12 through 15. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lo lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This was Paul's attitude. He said, I'm not there yet. I've not completely matured. I've not reached the level that I want to reach. I keep pressing onward. It's an admirable thing to say, but before we dismiss it, think again, this is an apostle who is saying this. This is the apostle Paul, and we know where, where his spiritual maturity was at, and he is saying, that's not enough for me. I keep pressing on. Was well, that a ridiculous attitude to have? Well, well Paul, that, that's just asking too much. Look at verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. See, a mark of spiritual maturity is the mindset that I've not attained it yet. I've not reached it yet. I've not perfected it yet and i'm going to keep trying i'm going to keep going a mature christian realizes that they still have things to learn they have yet to reach their goal and so they constantly press forward i mentioned dr pole in in our, our study a few moments ago how he's he's been practicing veterinary medicine for a long time he's in his 70s but yet, even with all of his wisdom and, and all of that experience that he has, there's still a refreshing humility about him. He has in his practice, he brings in young vets just out of, just out of school, and, and he works with them uh, to help them to get their feet on the ground in the practice. They, they've already learned things in school. Now they need to, to learn how to put it into practice. And so he takes in these young vets and he teaches them and helps them to learn hands-on experience how to do it. But something else I've seen him do on this show 
is he's actually learned from them. He realizes that they have just gone through school and they've just learned the latest information and the latest techniques. And so he has things to learn from them, just like he has some things to teach them. And that's a refreshing mark of maturity. Regardless of how long we've been serving the Lord, there's still room for improvement. There's still room for growth. There's still things that you and I need to learn to do and need to learn to do better. A mature Christian keeps on. I've heard older Christians who have said, you know, I've been at this enough. Uh, it, it's time for me to retire. It, it's time for me to, to, to slow down and to cut back. That's not what Paul says. Paul says, we keep on going forward. So that is a mark of spiritual maturity. I know that there are other things that, that we need to consider on this subject, but, but this is enough. This is a handful. Uh, this is enough for us to take with us the rest of the day and to think about. Uh, if you are a young Christian, you need to get your feet on the ground. You need to spend time in the milk of the word and, and learn the basics. But if you've been a Christian for any amount of time at all, you need to be maturing. You need to be pressing on. You need to be moving ahead. You need to be spending time in the word of God and learning how to rightly divide it. Learn what is in that Bible. You need to be learning the difference between right and wrong based on God's word. And you need to be making decisions in accordance with what God's word says is right and wrong. You need to be practicing self-control. You need to be loving others the way God teaches us to love others. And you need to be pressing forward. And let's encourage one another to be the best we can be and to always press forward. Those are some of the marks, some of the signs of spiritual maturity. I, I am thankful and grateful for the time that we can spend together this morning studying God's word and being challenged by God's word. What a shame it is to encounter someone who is a Christian and who, who claims that they've been a Christian for a long, long time. And yet, spiritually speaking, they're still in kindergarten. They haven't shown any growth whatsoever. I want to tell you, if you've been a Christian for a long, long time, and you don't know your Bible, and you don't know the difference between right and wrong in various situations, and you don't control yourself, and you're not loving like you should, and you're not reaching forward and trying, let me tell you what you've been doing. You've been wasting your time. That's what you've been doing. You've been repeating kindergarten over and over and over again. What a shame that is. In our text in Hebrews, the writer says, you know, you ought to be teachers by now. And you need someone to come and teach you again the first principles. Don't stay in kindergarten. That doesn't please God. That's not a laughing matter. Let's press on to spiritual maturity. That's the challenge I set before you. That's the challenge I set before myself in our study this morning. I hope that you have a great week ahead, uh, that you make the most of the time that you have in serving the Lord and in learning his word uh, and in letting your light shine before others so that they can see that you have hope, that you have faith, that God is making a difference in your life. Thank you again for studying together and Lord willing, uh, we'll be back together in this format on Wednesday at seven o'clock Eastern time. Until then, I hope you have a great week.